A very good morning to all and welcome to N Park's Spotlight. My name is Leslie and I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. Thank you all for joining us on Zoom and YouTube today. It is now September and we are very excited to kick off our Festival of Biodiversity. This is N Park's annual celebration of our natural heritage organized in collaboration with the Biodiversity Roundtable. This year, we are going online with our inaugural e-festival from the 5th to the 26th of September. From biodiversity talks to stay home activities, there's something for everyone to join in the fun and learning. We also have habitat enhancement sessions and guided walks for small groups at various locations. So do visit our website, nparks.gov.sg slash Festival of Biodiversity for more details. This month, we present a special edition of NParks Spotlight, featuring our partners from the biodiversity community. Today, we have the Herpetological Society of Singapore with us. And over the next few weeks, we'll be joined by Friends of Marine Park and the Raffles Bandit Langer Working Group. We'll also hear about the great work done by some of our citizen scientists as part of the Garden Bird Watch program. But more on that later. This is an overview of today's session. For those on Zoom, if you have any questions during the talk, you can send them to me, Leslie, as a private message using the Zoom chat. And we will try to address a few of them later on. We are almost ready, but as we have a short interactive portion coming up, please take a moment to scan this QR code or type www.menti.com in an internet browser and just keep this handy for later on. We'll give you a few moments to do so. Okay, we will be moving on with our program. If you haven't gotten the web page open yet, not to worry, we will share this again later. And now it's time to learn about our amazing reptiles and amphibians of Singapore. Please welcome the president and co-founder of the Herpetological Society of Singapore, Sanka Ananta Narayanan. Take it away, Sanka. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, hang on, let me just let, share my slides and we can get going. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Uh, very happy to be here with everyone to kick off the e-festival of biodiversity 2020. Uh, thanks for joining, uh, joining us on this rainy Saturday afternoon, uh, well, I guess Saturday morning. And uh, I'm really excited to be sharing some of this uh, amazing group of animals with all of you. Reptiles and amphibians can be found all over Singapore, uh, and I've been privileged to have encountered many of them in my own life as well. Uh, what we want to do, hopefully at the end of this session, is for everyone who is here to kind of have a better idea of just the insane biodiversity that we have in Singapore, as well as how to interact with these animals when we do encounter them. So uh, this year is a picture of a big-eyed whip snake, which is a species of whip snake that can be found in the forests of Singapore. They're called big-eyed whip snakes because they have like these really nice large eyes that are kind of inset in these narrow triangular faces. They're really beautiful uh, creatures. And I'll talk more about them in a bit. But first, I wanna, I wanna start off by introducing myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Sankar. I studied at the National University of Singapore and I graduated in 2019 with a bachelor's in environmental biology. So I actually uh, graduated at the same time as Leslie, who is our host for today. Uh, so in 2015, a group of friends and I, we founded the Herpetological Society of Singapore and we've been doing outreach about reptiles and amphibians ever since. Uh, right now, I'm working as a teaching assistant at my alma mater at NUS itself. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm really enjoying the work that I do. 
Okay, herpetology, it's a really big word, so not everyone may know what herpetology means, okay? Uh, to put it simply, herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Okay, reptiles and amphibians are not closely related to one another, but they both have very similar habits and they have very similar ecology. So it's very, uh, it's kind of a term of convenience. So herpetology, herpetologists usually study these animals together often. So in, you know, casually speaking, we talk about them as herpetofauna or just herps sometimes. We also call the act of going out to look for reptiles and amphibians in the wild herping. So some of you might have heard of birding where you go out to look for birds. This is kind of the same concept except with reptiles and amphibians where we go out into the forest to look for reptiles and amphibians. And that's where we get all these wonderful photos from. So most of the photos that I'll be using today are not my own, but they are of the members from the Herpetological Society of Singapore. Uh, they're amazing photographers, amazing guides, and uh, I, I'm privileged to be working with them. So it's, it's, it's really wonderful that uh, we have this great repository of, of, of photos to share with all of you. So what is the Herpetological Society of Singapore? That's our logo right there. Um, I'll just give a rundown of uh, what we do over the years, right? So this was several eons ago, back when we were allowed to meet in person. Uh, this was, I think, the Festival of Biodiversity 2018, if I'm not wrong. So uh, every year during the Festival of Biodiversity, the HSS makes it a point to come down and do outreach to the people who come for the festival, right? So uh, we usually do this by having like you know, specimens, we'll have some posters, we'll have some toys, we even have like badge making machines. And we usually have a really good, like, um, we have a really good kind of uh, outreach session. And it's usually very tiring. But this time we've had to kind of reorient ourselves and figure out how we can do it differently. Outside of that, we also do a lot of uh, guided walks. Every month we try to do a free guided walk for the public. This was, of course, in the times when we could have large gatherings like this. This was one of our larger walks uh, through Windsor Nature Park. And it was quite successful. I believe we saw quite a few snakes on that walk. Uh, all of us are very passionate about uh, education and herpetology. Uh, during our walks, we always encounter um, different groups of animals that we are very excited to talk to people about. Uh, I want to talk to, to you all about this one sign over here. Um, if you go to Treetop Walk and just walk down Venus Link, sorry for the low res photo. Uh, if you go to Treetop Walk and you walk down Venus Link, you'll see the sign uh, that says, caution, beware of snakes. So every time we walk past that sign, uh, I always stop the group and tell them, uh, let's take a photo in front of this sign. Uh, and, and it's always an opportunity to have a conversation about why we have that sign that says, beware of snakes, right? Because um, we try to always like shift the conversation to more about being aware of the snakes, right? Because ultimately, we are walking into a forest that is where snakes exist. Right, so it's not it's not surprising that there should be a snake in a forest, okay? Uh, and I think when we shift that conversation from beware of snakes to be aware of snakes, we can start talking about respecting these animals and start talking about how we can, you know, re respect them as native biodiversity. Okay, so uh, that's enough of me talking about myself and 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 the group of people that I work with, I want to really talk about the meat of today's presentation, which is herb diversity. As I said, Singapore has this absolutely insane range of biodiversity and, and, and herbs are no exception. They're, they're, um, almost every group of herb, herbs are represented in Singapore. And I'm going to take you all through that today. So herbs in general can be split into reptiles and amphibians. So let's start off with the amphibians. Okay, so let's talk about amphibian diversity. The most prominent amphibians that everyone would know about are your frogs, right? So these are some urban frogs that you might see in your very own estate. So maybe even hop hopping across a car park, you, I wouldn't be surprised to see an Asian toad or a four-line tree frog just hopping across the road. Um, the Asian toads, as you can tell, they have these warty, they have really warty skin and uh, right at the back of their neck, they have these two bumps. And that's how you know that it's an Asian toad. They're also known as black spine toads in some parts of the world. Uh, and uh, they they're very they're very heavily built, right? They're small, but they're heavily built, and they don't really hop very far. They they they, they hop like upwards more than forwards, so they're very cute. Uh, you also have tree frogs, right? Tree frogs look very different from your Asian toads, right? Can you see that they have toe pads that help them to climb up trees? They have 
uh, this very classic tree frog um, stance which they are employing, right? And, and that's with them like literally sitting vertically on a vertical surface. So the four line tree frog is one very common one. And you might even hear it uh, calling in at night after rainy, maybe after rainy nights like uh, last night, you might actually hear these kinds of calls. So you can hear that kind of a duck call, right? So it sounds like a duck quacking. So that's actually the call of the four line tree frog. Uh, and they're very common uh, in, in Singapore's urban parks and gardens. But these frogs are, you, you find more diversity when you go to places like your forests, and uh, they all exist within the same groups. So these are toads and tree frogs that live only in our forests. You can't find them outside of our forests. On the left-hand side, you have the four-ridged toad. This is a beautiful orange-colored toad. Again, it's covered in warts, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's much less, uh, I think, heavily built than your Asian toad. Uh, and they have possibly the most interesting call of all the frogs, at least in my opinion. So they actually kind of sound like a telephone. Uh, and I actually have a friend who turned it into a ringtone for his phone. Uh, they have very nice uh, frog calls. Now the forage toads are only found in your forest. If you go on a walk through Windsor Park, you might actually hear them calling at 4 p.m. It's very nice to hear toads calling in the daytime. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's really cool that we have this diversity here. Cinnamon bush frogs are actually, uh, and uh, they're actually a threatened species of, of frog and uh, they are not very commonly seen. Uh, they are tree frogs, similar to your uh, common tree frog, the four line tree frog that I showed earlier. And you can see that they have the same toe pads as well, right? So they have extremely arboreal habitats. Arboreal means they live up on trees, right? So they are often found calling from the canopies uh, and, and, and because they're so high up, we never see them, right? Uh, so these, these frogs are actually placed on the uh, species recovery program right now. And uh, it's, it's, it's nice to know that uh, we still have them around. So the way that they reproduce is actually, since they live so high up on the treetops, they don't lay their eggs in ponds. They actually find phytotherms, which are tree holes filled with water and they lay their eggs inside. So that's a really cool thing about how um, cinnamon bush frogs reproduce. Sometimes you even see them in artificial structures that you know that just happen to be collecting water, and uh, cinnamon bush frog tadpoles will be swimming around inside. So that's great. Sometimes you also have frogs that are not so obvious. So your Malayan horn frog is a really, really uh, well hidden frog. So your Malayan horn frogs, you can see very closely. If you look closely, you can see that they have these fleshy protrusions from their eyes, from on top of their eyes and in front of their nose, right? So that's why they're called horn frog. Now, when you look at them from the top down, they actually look exactly like a dead leaf and they don't move at all. So when you see them in the, when you see them in the forest, they pretty much blend in exactly with their surroundings and you would never be able to tell that they're there until they make their call, which is, which is really distinctive. It sounds like a, like a truck horn. It's like, eh. Which is, which is a really cute, um, I think, call for such a chunky looking frog. And they always look grumpy, um, but that's just how big their mouth is. So these frogs only exist in, um, in pristine uh, streams. So you need a good forest in order to be able to support animals like this. So the fact that we are still able to find Malayan horn frogs in some parts of Singapore shows that we do have forests that is able to support these species as well. Sometimes you find frogs that you didn't even know were there, right? So you have Microletta. Um, it doesn't have a common name just yet because the species might not have been uh, completely described yet. So uh, this species was first found in 2019, and I was lucky enough to be to be there when 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 we found the species, right? So we were just walking along a drain, and this tiny little frog jumps out, and immediately we knew it didn't look like any frog that we had ever seen before in Singapore. Right, so um, it's the it's 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 a really really beautiful looking uh, paddy frog. Uh, I think it's called a paddy frog. In, sorry, not paddy frog. Uh, uh, it, it's a it's a really cute looking cor frog, and um, it's it's uh, it, it it's not very easy to see as well because it's so small. And uh, again, we didn't even know that it was in Singapore until twenty nineteen. Now, um, that's, that's it for frogs, uh, but here we have a truly curious looking creature. So this is a picture from Malaysia and Italy, but it looks very similar to what you would find in Singapore, 
right? So in Singapore, we have the Sumatran striped Sicilian. And the Sumatran striped Sicilian looks very similar to this. And when people look at this, they might think that it's a worm or a snake or an eel or a fish or something like that. But Sicilians are actually more closely related. In fact, they are amphibians. They are more closely related to frogs and salamanders and newts than anything else. And how do I know that? How do I know that this creature is not a worm, right? So if you look closely, you can actually see that they have eyes. Can you see the eyes over here? And how do I know it's not a snake? Snakes are covered in scales. Sicilians have no scales, right? If this was a worm, you'd see lots of segments, whereas this isn't really segmented in the same way a worm is. So that's how you know that this is an amphibian, right? Now, Sicilians are very hard to see. In fact, only two or three of them have been seen in the last 20 years. They are very, very rare in Singapore. Uh, and I think the, the, the recent Bukit Timah biodiversity survey found two, and that was like the first record in, 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 in a decade or two. So these, these, these creatures live under uh, leaf litter and their, and their larvae are completely aquatic. So they spend so much of their time in the water. And the fact that we have Sicilians still in Singapore shows that there is still habitat that deserves protection, that deserves uh, caring about. And there's still so much habitat that, you know, um, should be conserved. Uh, so these are creatures that most people might not have seen or even heard of in their entire lives. And the fact that, you know, there's biodiversity inside our forest that we didn't know was there in the first place shows that, you know, when you lose a forest, you lose much more than just the trees in there. You lose the animals and the plants that call that place home as well. Okay, so that's all I have for amphibians. Amphibians are a truly, truly interesting group, um, but I want to move on to the reptiles as well. Okay, so first off, I'm going to start talking about one of the largest reptiles that we have in Singapore, which is, of course, your estuarine crocodile, right? Uh, I think it's a pretty well-known fact that you can go to Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve and very reliably, very easily see estuarine crocodiles all over the place. Uh, these saltwater crocodiles are found uh, often basking on the mudflats and sometimes there's like uh, this little mini island that like, you know, when, when, when the tide is low, is this island gets exposed uh, and I often see uh, saltwater crocodiles sunning themselves there. Uh, I, always, I always think it's a wonderful thing that we have crocodiles because crocodiles are apex predators. They are at the very top of the food chain. Uh, an adult, nothing is going to mess with an adult crocodile, right? So the fact that we have ecosystems like Sungai Bolo Nature Reserve, and now uh, Sungai, Sungai Bolo Nature Network, um, the fact that we have you know, na na nature areas that are able to support large apex predators like this, it just shows how healthy that ecosystem is uh, and the fact that it is able to provide you know enough food enough uh, enough nutrition for, for for animals like this shows that there is a, a good a, a decently functioning ecosystem in place there so a lot of people would be uh, i think a little bit cautious and, and i can understand where that comes from right because these are large apex predators as i've mentioned um, i think it's understandable to be cautious of of, of crocodiles, but at the same time, uh, we need to understand that these crocodiles don't want anything to do with humans, right? They have been driven here because there is some habitat here that is uh, conducive for them that they are able to survive in and maybe even thrive in, uh, but it has nothing to do with humans. Uh, it's not because they want to eat people, they, they simply want to be left alone. And as a result, if you leave these animals alone, if let's say you encounter them in Sungai Bolo Wetland Reserve, if you leave them alone, they will leave you well alone as well. Okay, so we only have that one species of crocodile. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next group, which is turtles, right? Uh, everyone knows about sea turtles, right? We've all watched Finding Nemo. Sea turtles are one of the coolest groups of animals that we have. Um, Several species have shown up in Singapore. Uh, in 1883, there was a leatherback turtle that showed up. Uh, that was really cool. Uh, and unfortunately, it was found dead. You can find that leatherback turtle at the museum now on the second floor. But uh, today, still, we have hawksbill sea turtles showing up on our beaches and laying eggs and hatching in Singapore. Uh, I think that's amazing because these, these turtles, they find their way back to their original hatching grounds and lay their eggs there. So these turtles are remembering where they were born. 
and they come back to Singapore. So how many of the turtles that hatch today will come back in 50 years time or 60 years time or whenever to, to lay their own eggs? So I think it's very important to ensure that we continue to maintain that, that, um, that ecological balance that allows these animals to thrive in our waters, right? So this is the hawksbill sea turtle. Um, they're called hawksbill because they have a very sharp beak at the, t at the tip of their nose, at the tip of their snouts. Uh, this was a hatchling that I was lucky enough to encounter when I went for a hatching event. So the sea turtles were hatching and they were being released back into the water. Uh, and I managed to snap this photo. They're really, really cute. They're so small. But the adult hawksbill turtles are so big. They are massive compared to the, the, the juveniles, right? So, so many of these juveniles don't make it to adulthood. But the ones that do are like tanks. There's nothing that's going to mess with them. Now, the hawksbill sea turtle actually used to be hunted for their shell. So, if you look at their shell, you can actually see that they have this very intricate pattern on it. And this pattern was actually prized because they uh, used to use hawksbill sea turtle shells to create tortoiseshell items. So I'm, I'm sure you've seen tortoiseshell combs, tortoiseshell cabinets, and, and, and things like that. Um, and they were almost hunted to extinction, but uh, luckily that practice has fallen out of favor. And now we see hawksbills returning to some of the waters that they belong in. By the way, these photos are both in Singapore. Right, so it's it's very hard to imagine um, waters as clear as this in Singapore, but we do have clear waters in Singapore that can support sea turtles. Now we also have forest turtles, right? So not all turtles are sea turtles. We also have forest turtles. We have spiny hill turtles. Uh, these are really cute species that you can often see like walking along streams uh, and inside forests on the forest floor, and they'll eat pretty much whatever they see. So they sometimes eat fruits uh, and 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 other other things that they can they can find on the ground. Then you have your Malayan box turtle. Uh, Malayan box turtles are truly, truly adorable because they are able, you see this, the, the underside of their shell, right? They're able to actually, it's actually on a hinge. They can actually retract their heads inside and shut their, their shut the door on their shell, literally sealing them up like a box. And that's why they're called box turtles. So these are native species of turtles that you can find in our, uh, in our, eco, in our terrestrial forests and, and waterways. But uh, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of the time, the most common species of turtle that you see in Singapore is your red-eared slider. The red-eared slider is, a, is an American species of turtle that is brought in as a pet. And a lot of people buy it when it's very small and cute. And then when it gets bigger and then they realize they can't handle it, they throw it into a pond or they throw it into a reservoir. And, and then they start competing with native species of turtles, right? Like your uh, Malayan box turtle. So uh, when you have... If you have any friends or family who are considering, you know, buying a radiate slider as a pet, uh, do advise them about what responsible pet ownership can look like and how, and, and, and consider them to think about the fact that a pet is for life uh, and that it's not something to, you know, abandon once it gets too hard to handle. Okay, so that's it for turtles. There are a few other turtles, like your soft shell turtles. Um, but I think I want to talk more about the lizards right now. Singapore has many species of lizards, and I think there is no better place to start than your monitor lizards, okay? Singapore actually has three species of monitor lizards that can be found, uh, but these two are the most commonly seen. So you have, first and foremost, you have your Malayan water monitor, right? So a lot of people, when they see these creatures, they think it's a, you know, a Komodo dragon or you know, a Godzilla or a dinosaur or something like that. But these are actually Malayan water monitors, Varana Salvatore. Okay, uh, as their name implies, they are very aquatic. They love living around water bodies. So you can see them in reservoirs. You can see them in mangroves. You can see them, um, you know, uh, you can see them pretty much where there is large, water, water, large bodies of water. You can see Malayan water monitors uh, swimming around inside them. Compare that with the clouded monitor. Uh, these are much smaller. They have a bit more, you know, uh, like intricate patterning on their back, uh, but when they're small, it's quite hard to distinguish between the two of them. Clouded monitors spend a lot of time in forests. They climb up trees and they like to come down to uh, dig through the leaf litter to look for grubs and uh, other things, right? So how do you tell them apart? Because they look really similar, right? The answer is in the nose. So look at the snout of the Malayan water monitor, right? This nostril is at the very tip of the snout. So the tip, when the nostril is at the tip of the snout is because the Malayan water monitor likes to stay submerged and its nostrils will just be poking out of the water so it doesn't have to come out of the water in order for 
it to, uh, it to take in air. So the nostrils are in a very good position for it. Compare that with the clouded monitor, the nostril is actually much closer to the eye. There's, there's, there's quite a bit of snout here before the nostril itself. So uh, this allows the, the monitor as well to dig through the ground and also be able to breathe at the same time. So they're adapted for two very different lifestyles. There's a third species, the Dumeril monitor, but that is very rare and it's only found in swamp forests in Singapore. It's very cool. Okay, uh, we have some species of dragon lizards as well. So when I say dragon lizard, I literally mean they're called dragon lizards. This entire family of lizards, agamids, are called dragon lizards. Uh, and sometimes it's not hard to see why. Uh, this is the Sumatran flying dragon. Uh, and as the name implies, they are actually able to glide from one tree to another. Okay, sharing screen again. Oh, no, this one. Okay. Isn't it amazing that we have literally like dragons that can glide from one tree to another? So. I work as a teaching assistant at NUS and we were doing like a socially distant guided walk uh, for the students a while back. And we actually got to see one Draco lizard just gliding from one tree to another in, in front of us at Kent Ridge Park. So these aren't like super rare species that can be only found in the forest. They are actually found even in relatively urbanized parks and gardens. So it's, it's quite amazing that we are living right alongside with these animals. Uh, we also have other species of dragon lizards, like your Eolus agamids. Um, this is a spectacular species that's found in, um, I think, more pristine forests. Uh, and the reason I think they're really, they're really spectacular is because in the males, they're actually, uh, they, they have this really beautiful blue color iris uh, on their eye. And that's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really, it, it, I think it's the, the, the blue color is something that, that really always throws me off whenever I see it. There are other agamids as well that we have uh, that I'm sure some of you might have seen before. Uh, the green crested lizard and the changeable lizard. So my grandmother, she came to Singapore in, um, I think, the 60s. And uh, she used to see these all over the place. And uh, she calls them chameleons, right? She, she insists to me that they are chameleons in Singapore but because they change their color. Right? So the green crested lizard and the changeable lizard are able to change their color. Does that mean they're chameleons? No, because chameleons are actually a different family altogether. Changing color is something that you can see in many different groups of animals, not necessarily just chameleons. Right? Even within lizards, many lizards can change their color without necessarily being um, chameleons. Right? So uh, the green crested lizard is the native species that we have in Singapore, and they are gorgeous. They have these black ring around their eyes and a black spot on their ear. Uh, and they are generally quite uh, restricted to your secondary and uh, secondary forest habitats, right? So if you go to say Lower Pierce, uh, you might be able to see them just clinging onto the, the, the trees at the edge of the forest. Uh, compare that with your changeable lizard, which is actually an introduced species. This is a photo by Leslie. Uh, this is an introduced species that can be found even in urban habitats. So I wouldn't be surprised to see one again running across a car park. Uh, because they're so urbanized at this point, right? So you can see them just clinging on to roadside trees um, and, and they're quite common at that point. So the changeable lizard, when, it's, uh, when, when they are about to breathe, the males will turn their heads bright orange in color uh, and they'll often have a black beard as well. So that's, these changeable lizards were actually introduced a while, uh, several decades ago and um, since then they have outcompeted the green crested lizard in uh, urbanized parks and gardens. So you don't see change, uh, green crested lizards that often in urbanized parks and gardens. Changeable lizards have taken over those, uh, those spaces instead. Geckos. Uh, everyone has seen geckos, I'm sure. At some point in your life, in your houses, you would have seen a gecko or two, right? Uh, some people have had the unfortunate experience of having geckos fall on them. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. I want to introduce you all to the more common species of geckos that you are likely to find in your houses. Right? So you have your morning gecko, right? Morning geckos are beautiful, also known as maritime geckos. Uh, they're beautiful and they have these chevron uh, style patterns running down their backs, right? Now, this is actually an all female species, which means every single individual of morning gecko is a strong independent woman. Uh, they don't have any males at all. In fact, they just lay eggs and the baby is, uh, is, is a virtual clone of the, of the mother. So that way they're able to spread across ecosystems really fast. 
Uh, folklore geckos are also very common, probably the ones that you see most often in your houses. Uh, they're called folklore geckos not because they only have four fingers, but because of the five fingers that they have, only four of them have claws. Okay. Uh, then you have, oh, sorry. Uh, then you have two other geckos. You have your flat tail geckos and your spiny tail geckos. They're both in the same genus, so they're closely related. But the way you can tell them apart is by looking at their tail, right? So the flat tail gecko has a flat tail. Spiny tail gecko has a spiny tail, so it's got spines running down the top. Very simple, very easy to identify. The colors don't mean anything because geckos do background matching, okay? So that means their colors will vary from place to place depending on what substrate they're on, what, what background they're on. So if they're on a different background, they'll have slightly different colors. Well. Some geckos can only be found in the forest, right? So you have your Panti Bento gecko. This was a species that was only found on, in Singapore at least, it's only found in Pulau Tekong uh, so far, right? So for the guys going to, well, or, or, or anybody going to uh, basic military training next time, uh, please, yeah, look out, for, look out for, perhaps you'll be the next, you have the next record of Panti Bento gecko in, in Tekong. So uh, these, these bento geckos are really cool uh, and they're very diverse as well. Um, it's, it's just wild how many new species of bento geckos are being discovered every year. Uh, we also have cool gliding geckos. So remember I talked about how geckos, some people have had geckos falling on them, right? Gliding geckos, very similar to the draco lizard that I mentioned just now. Uh, they are covered in flaps on their skin, right? So they're actually able to parachute down, not as well as the Draco, but they're able to slow their fall down enough that they can jump down from uh, relatively high heights and still survive. Yeah, so the cool gliding gecko is also quite rarely seen and it's a forest specific species. You won't find it in your HDB estates. Skinks, so we have lots of skinks uh, running around Singapore, uh, some tree skinks and some ground skinks. Uh, so these are the ground skinks, right? So you have this common sun skink. And oftentimes, if you walk through any secondary forest habitat, like lower piers, uh, when the sunlight filters in through the canopy and hits the ground, you have these sunspots on the ground. These sun skinks are always found basking in those sunspots. Uh, so keep an eye out for them. They're very common and they see invertebrates. They eat invertebrates that they see on the ground. Some skinks are new to science. Like we didn't even know they were a species until very recently. So this is the Tamasek swamp skink. It's very cute. Uh, it's very small. And it's very rarely seen. Um, so it's got a very nice name as well, Titus kinkus tomasigensis. Um, and uh, very little is known about them because they were only officially described in 2017. So really, there's, there's not much that we know about this king except that we have it in Singapore and it's described from Singapore. Okay, now I'm sure uh, this is the part that everyone has been excited for. Uh, well, maybe not everyone. I like, I like frogs as well. So I, I was quite excited to talk about frogs, but I love snakes. Uh, my personal interest is in reticulated pythons. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be talking about this as well. Okay, so uh, here you have two species of snakes that don't really look like snakes, right? So this is a Brahmini blind snake. And you can actually see that it is not a worm. Many people call it a worm snake, but uh, you know, from the fact that you can see the eyes and the fact that you can see scales, you know that this is not a worm. It's, it's definitely a snake. So this is actually an individual that my colleague at NUS found. And uh, I managed to, I mean, it, it was unfortunately dead. So I just took a photo of it under a microscope. And you can actually see the scalation, which is really, really beautiful. Uh, so Brahmi blind snakes often called flower pot snakes. They also eat ants and termites. They're a really, really cool species when you actually get to know them better. They are found all over the world. They are one of the most common species of snakes in the world. Uh, that's because much like the morning gecko, they actually are an all-female species. They just lay eggs and clone themselves. So it's a very, it's a very uh, efficient system. Then you have your gimlet tree snake, Calamaria gimleti, right? Also very beautiful. Uh, some people might mistake it for a worm if they first see it. Um, this was originally um, recorded from Pulau Pawai, one of our southern islands in 1933. And then I think only around the 2000s, they identified the specimen correctly as gimlet's reed snake. Uh, so until 2017, there was no indication that it was found in, in, in mainland Singapore at all. Uh, it was finally rediscovered in 2017 um, by, by, by a few people actually from the HSS, which is, which is I think, really cool. So uh, yeah, gimlet sweet snake, really cool species. And they're often found in the leaf litter. They look like worms, but they're not worms. 
Okay, so these are the largest snakes, right? So some snakes can get really big, like your reticulated pythons, and some are a bit more subtle, like your sunbeam snake. The sunbeam snakes aren't actually that subtle. If you look at their scales, when you shine a light on them just right, they actually have this rainbow iridescence. In fact, uh, Adidas, the shoe company, actually released a, a, a sh a, like a line of shoes inspired by sunbeam snakes. Uh, they called it the Adidas Zeno. And if you shine a light the right way, it, uh, it, it, it has like a rainbow color on it, which is really cool. Uh, so sunbeam snakes are, 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 are pretty common even in urban areas, uh, but they're not regularly seen. Reticulated pythons, on the other hand, are common in urban areas and very regularly seen. Uh, many people encounter them in their houses, uh, around their houses. And it is, I think, a little bit scary to consider that this, the largest species of snake in the world, can be found next door, right next door to us uh, and, and, and in quite close proximity. And again, the thing to remember is that these snakes want nothing to do with us, right? The only reason that they are in urban areas is because they've been pushed out of their forest habitats that they originally come from. And also because there is food opportunity here, right? When we don't take care of our trash properly, we have rats running around all over urban estates. And so the reticulated pythons naturally will come through the sewers in, in search of rats. So the fact that we have pythons at all is, I, I think it's indicative of the fact that we have rats all over the place. And the pythons are actually uh, biological pest control. We treat them as pests, unfortunately, but they are actually biological pest control. And uh, pythons help to keep the population of rats down as well. Uh, cat snakes and rat snakes. So rat snakes, as their name suggests, uh, largely eat rats, rodents, small uh, vertebrates. And uh, they are also known as racers because they go really fast. So they have these beautiful eyes, beautiful large eyes, and they always look very cute. I think rat snakes have some of the cutest faces of any snakes. Uh, we have three species of them in Singapore. Uh, compare that with the cat snake. Uh, cat snakes aren't called cat snakes because they eat cats. Uh, it's because they have uh, eyes that look like cat's eyes. So uh, as a result of that, it looks uh, really gorgeous. We have four species of cat snakes in Singapore, and this is the most common one. It was recently renamed to Boiga melanota, but I'm sure that'll change again. Uh, this is the gold-ringed cat snake. You also have other species of uh, smaller snakes. So you have your big-eyed whip snake, which I showed you all at the very first slide. In fact, um, there's another perspective of it. It's very closely related to your oriental whip snake, which is found in even uh, urbanized parks and gardens, right? And uh, these big-eyed whip snakes love resting above moving bodies of water and stream, apparently. Uh, but big-eyed whip snakes are restricted to your forests and, 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 and nature reserves. Then you also have your twin bar tree snake. So twin bar tree snakes, uh, well, Singapore doesn't have a national reptile, but if I had a boat, I would vote for the twin bar tree snake because it looks so patriotic. It's red and white and it's some black thrown in. Uh, twin bar tree snakes are also known as twin bar flying snakes, right? Because they are able to flatten themselves like ribbons and literally just throw themselves off trees, uh, glide from one tree to another. So you, you must be sensing a trend here, right? You've seen the Draco, the cool gliding gecko, the twin bar tree snake, all able to flatten themselves and glide off trees. That's because in the tropical rainforest, it's so much easier to just get from point A to point B than to climb down a tree, cross over to the other side and climb up a tree again. So it's, it's gliding is an effective method of getting around. And that's why it's occurred so many different times in, in the tropical rainforest. So these are related to your paradise tree snake, which are very common in parks and gardens, and you might have seen them as well. I think in any place that you're in, it's very important to know what venomous species of snakes you have there. Uh, so I'm gonna cover every single highly venomous species of snake in Singapore, okay? So you have your Malayan blue coral snake. This is probably one of the more famous ones. Um, you also have the Malayan banded coral snake, which is less famous, but also, but no less attractive if you ask me. So the blue coral snake, uh, as the name implies, is electric blue in color, right? And it's got this beautiful, gorgeous, orange head, orange belly, and I think if you can see it, there's an orange tail over there as well. Red red belly, red tail, yeah. So um, Malayan blue coral snakes have these very long um, venom glands that uh, enable them to take down their prey very quickly. So coral snakes actually, for the most part, consume other snakes, which is uh, something that you don't see very often with um, most species of snakes. The Malayan banded coral snake is much smaller uh, and the way you can tell them apart is this one has like a red stripe running down the vertebrae. Uh, and it also has this very nice black and white patterning on its belly. 
right? So they, whenever they are, whenever they are threatened, they'll actually show red color or, or, or the black and white color in order to, you know, uh, scare off their attackers. So uh, there's also other species of snakes. You have your bandit crate. Bandit crates are uh, rather large uh, and they are highly venomous as well. Their venom is 100% neurotoxin, right? So these species are found uh, often in coastal forests. So if you go to Pulau Ubin, you might have you might end up seeing some of these as well. Uh, just a, just one note about the bandit the, the coral snakes. Coral snakes are restricted to your forest, so you won't find them in HDB estates. These are only really found in forests and um, in, 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 you know, in, in better habitat. Uh, again, because they're so brightly colored, it's very hard not to see them. Um, I think a lot of people are afraid of accidentally stepping on one. Snakes have many methods of making sure you see them first before you uh, accidentally step on them. So the blue coral snake, bandit coral snake, a very colorful species, you will definitely see them. The only snake, the only venomous snake that is regularly found in urban habitats is your equatorial spitting cobra, right? And spitting cobras have that uh, habit of, you know, uh, you know, spreading their hood and, and raising themselves up, uh, hissing at their, at, at, at their, at their, at whoever is threatening them. Uh, but ultimately, if they don't feel cornered, they will make their own way away. So if you see one, as long as you leave it alone, the spitting cobra will probably leave you alone as well. I mean, it'll definitely leave you alone. It'll probably just like find its own way out. Uh, spitting cobras, as their name implied, they are able to spit their venom uh, up to one, 1 1.5 meters distance. Uh, and the reason they do this is to blind their attackers to make sure that it's not, it's not to take down prey or anything like that. It's, it's a purely defensive move. Then of course you have your king cobra, the, which for many hoppers like myself is considered the holy grail of uh, snakes to see because this is literally the king cobra. If you look at the scientific name, it says Ophiophagus hanna. So indulge me a little bit. This is um, Latin. So Ophiophagus means snake eater, right? So the king cobra is a snake that eats other snakes. As you can see over here, this is a photo from Sungai Bolo Wetland Reserves by Lipke. Um, and you can actually see the king cobra. I think this is, it's eating a Gerard's water snake perhaps. So um, the king cobra is actually famous for eating other species of snakes and, and being very picky about what it eats. Um, it's the largest species of venomous snake in the entire world. And I think, again, it's amazing that we get to see these species in Singapore because we have ecosystems that are capable of supporting apex predators, right? Uh, again, if you leave these snakes alone, they will leave you alone as well. The fact that they're apex predators doesn't mean that they pose a threat to people. Uh, yeah, so that's the king cobra. Uh, waggler's pit vipers and shore pit vipers. So I only had space for the female waggler's pit viper, but do Google what the male waggler's pit viper looks like as well. It's uh, bright green with red and white spots running down its side. Um, it's a gorgeous looking uh, snake species. Now, uh, the Waggler's Pit Viper is commonly found in our nature reserve. So if you go to Central Catchment, Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, you could very easily see a Waggler's Pit Viper resting on one of the branches there. Uh, same thing for your Shore Pit Viper, right? They are uh, regular, as the name implies, they are often found along shorelines. They are often found in, um, in um, mangrove habitats as well, right? So the reason they're called Pit Vipers is because if you look closely at their faces, you'll see this small hole right in front of their face uh, in front of their eyes, right? So that's not their nostril. That's actually the pit, the heat sensing pit. So the pit viper, much like uh, for some of y'all who might've watched the movie Predator, um, it actually has heat vision and is able to sense warm blooded prey in front of itself, um, even in pitch darkness, which is amazing. Yeah. So those are the seven highly venomous species of snakes that you can see in Singapore. I'll just go through them really quickly again. Malayan blue coral snake, Malayan bandit coral snake, bandit creek, Equatorial Spitting Cobra, King Cobra, Waggler's Pit Viper, and Shaw Pit Viper. Okay, so these are the only highly venomous species of snakes in Singapore. Out of the 70, uh, 60 plus species of snakes that we have, only seven of them are highly venomous, are known to be highly venomous. So I think um, people tend to think that all snakes are poisonous, all snakes are venomous. That's not true. Um, it's actually a minority of them that are this way. And most of them are restricted to forests. Um, very few of them are found in urban areas. So the chances of encountering one are quite low as well. Okay, uh, let's revise. I have prepared a quiz on Menti uh, and Leslie and Yongjen have sent you all the link as well. So you can actually scan this QR code to get directly to the quiz. 
Uh, or you can visit menti.com on your phone and enter this code, 85018501796. All right, so I'll give you all a few moments to do that. Uh, Yongjen has typed it in on the chat. I'm going to share screen. I'll give people a few moments to join. I'm assuming all these hearts mean people coming in. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll get started first, then folks who want to join in can just join in by joining with the link, right? So in front of us, we see a gorgeous looking lizard, right? Uh, some of you might have seen these lizards before. I definitely mentioned it in my talk just now. Uh, so let's see how many of you are able to identify this species. Okay, waiting for players. So everyone in, wow, that's, that's a whole lot of people. Um, okay, keep it coming, everyone. I will start the countdown and we can, the faster you answer this, the more points you get. Name that lizard. Look at your phone and name that lizard. There was supposed to be music, but then it's very uh, jarring. So I muted the music so you can listen to my beautiful voice instead. <laughs> so is it a chameleon, a green crested lizard, a changeable lizard, or a greater angle head? That's right. It is a green crested lizard. Well done to everyone who got the correct answer. For those who didn't, that's totally okay. There are more questions along the way. Uh, that was indeed a green crested lizard and a green crested lizard is something that is found in our secondary forests uh, and our, our more forested areas. They are not so common in your um, parks and gardens. Uh, sorry, not parks and gardens, in your uh, urban habitats. Okay, next question. Question two or four. Okay, there's no picture for this one. Instead, you will have to answer this question. Which of the following herbs typically cannot be found in urban habitats? Is it the Asian toad, the reticulated python, the radiate slider, or the gold ringed cat snake? <clears throat> so I, I will use frog calls as a holding music for the next one. Well done, everyone. So uh, this one seems a bit more evenly spread. Yeah. Asian toads, as I said, they can be found even crossing car parks uh, quite regularly. They are very urban species and they don't need to actually remain super close to water as well. Toads are relatively independent of water. Uh, reticulated pythons are very urban as well, sometimes found even around people's houses. Um, Red-eared sliders, they actually are an introduced species, so you almost always see them in urban habitats. gold ring cat snakes are the forest specific species, you would not see one in an urban habitat. Well done. So this is the gold ring cat snake, okay? Picture by Sarin Subaraj. Beautiful, look at the eyes. Okay, this is the unidentified Sicilian, right? So what I want you all to do is to tell me, <clears throat> enter content, okay. I'll play some frog calls. Sicilians are most closely related to which of the following groups? Frogs, fish, snakes, or worms? Time's up, okay. Well done, everyone. So Sicilians, they look, they look a lot like snakes, they look a lot like worms, but actually they are amphibians at the end of the day. They are completely reliant on uh, aquatic ecosystems to lay their eggs and to have their babies, um, much like frogs. Even though they don't look anything like frogs or salamanders, they are amphibians. Okay, this is a reticulated python that I encountered uh, in Singapore, right? They are really cute and they have puppy dog faces. Now, my question is, my final question is, 
Which of the following forms the bulk of a python's diet? So what does a python eat most of the time in Singapore? Birds, rats, humans, or cats? Okay, back to the music. And time's up. Okay, please. Oh my god, who chose humans? All right, pythons, for the most part, eat rats. Uh, there are occasions where they take birds and cats, but that is a minority of the time. Most of the time, uh, reticulated pythons in Singapore are found eating rats. Um, that was actually what I studied for my final year thesis, and um, most pythons have rats inside them. So it's a good thing that we have pythons in our urban habitats because they are ensuring that our urban spaces are relatively free of rats as well in the long term. Okay, uh, they definitely, in Singapore at least, they definitely don't consume humans. So that's not something that anyone needs to be worried about. Okay. Uh, let's see the leaderboard. <clears throat> Big congratulations to Samuel Lim, the Batman. I think that's how this works. Yes, well done. You you have won this game. I, I don't have a prize for you, but uh, thank you for your participation. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go back to the slides. Okay, can everyone see the slides? Can I? Okay. So thank you so much for that, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to see uh, most of the folks are, are they, they understand the biodiversity that we have around us. And I hope uh, most of it is something that you learned new today. So here's what you can do when you encounter these animals in the wild. Uh, but first we have to ask the question, why are people afraid? Let's think back to that sign at Treetop Walk, which said, beware of snakes, right? Uh, Perhaps that is actually very, uh, that's, that's a very classic Singaporean mentality where we are, when we see a snake and we think that it wants to eat us. Uh, and we can see that in the language that is used in a lot of posts about these snakes, right? So look at this, look at this uh, screenshot of Stomp, right? Where it says, um, Python found at East Coast Jetty, horrific find, then they, the, they pixelate the snake to make it extra clickbaity. Uh, and then you have, oh, there's a Python that strangles a neighborhood cat. Um, and woman in tears, and it's just like, you know, super incendiary. And you can see more of that as well, right? Like um, a python is a nightmare find in a home or after a man tries to grab a 2.5 meter python, it turns aggressive. When I think like we should really be reframing the way we talk about these animals in the first place. It's not beware of snakes, it's be aware of snakes. Ultimately, these snakes are here, these snakes were here long before we were, and uh, these animals were here long before we were. So why are we treating them with such uh, hatred and with such disgust? Uh, even the words that we use, like aggressive, right? This python wasn't aggressive at all. It was being defensive. And there's a big difference right? because the, the man was disturbing it in the first place and that caused it to get, uh, you know, defensive, not aggressive. So here's what you can do when you encounter uh, a snake or any herb in the wild. Most importantly, don't panic because these animals don't mean you any harm. If you leave them alone, they will leave you alone as well. Observe these herbs from a safe distance. Take photos, but don't get too close. A good rule of thumb is stay 1.5 times the creature's length away from that creature. So if you see a two meter snake, stay three meters away from it. That's a good rule of thumb, okay? If you or the animal is in danger, you can contact Acres or NParks. Acres has a wildlife rescue hotline. NParks also has a 24 hour animal response center. Um, I think Yongzhen will be sharing these, these numbers on the chat, so please, uh, save those numbers and tell people around you that these are the numbers to contact if you encounter these animals. A lot of people call pest control, but remember, these animals are not pests. That's the biggest takeaway for today, right? Animals are not pests. They are wild animals and calling pest control on them would be like calling pest control on an otter or a pangolin that you encounter. Why should we be treating these animals any different because they look differently? They are wildlife, native wildlife, that deserve the same respect as any other creature that we respect. Right, so this is a blue neck killback, which is a forest species of snake. They are both venomous and poisonous, which is really cool. Now, um, what can you do? You can educate your friends and family. So you've attended this talk. You are now educated. You have learned so much about these reptiles and amphibians. Now what you can do is to continue that work. You can tell your friends and family about 
reptiles and amphibians in Singapore. What does respect mean when, it, when, when, when we're talking about wild animals? What does uh, responsible pet ownership mean? And how, what are the impacts that we have on our ecosystem? Uh, learn about how you can respectfully interact with these creatures. Like I said, um, the HSS use of regularly organized guided walks. Um, once phase three starts, we fully intend to restart those walks again. So please do join us in those walks as participants uh, and learn how to appreciate nature from a safe distance. You know? um, I think all forms of nature are beautiful, uh, whether it's an otter, a pangolin, or you know, a blind snake that we see on the ground. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's all I have for my talk. I truly appreciate it if you could check out the HSS, the Herpetological Society of Singapore. These are our social media links. You can find us online at herpsocksg.com, herpsocksg at gmail.com if you want to send us any email, any questions, facebook.com slash herpsocksg, at herpsocksg for Twitter and for Instagram. So uh, I think Yongjen is also sending these on the chat. Feel free to you know, get in touch with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sanka, for that eye-opening and fun presentation. Thank okay, you. We'll, we got a lot of uh, questions from the audience, but in the interest of time, we'll just go through a few. But thank you so much, all of you, for your enthusiasm. So the first question which um, one of our audience members has is, yeah. how do you tell the difference between frogs and toads? Ah, good question. Okay, so all toads are frogs. Okay, so true toads is a family of frogs. All toads are frogs, and generally, Toads uh, are, you know, they are more warty. Uh, this isn't always true. There are frogs that are warty as well. But uh, toads tend to be covered in these bumps and warts. And they also have these two large bumps on the back of their neck um, that are called paratoid glands. And these paratoid glands actually uh, secrete a toxin known as bufotoxin. So true toads, all toads are actually a family of frogs. Uh, but not all frogs are toads. All toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So toads are a type of frog. Hope that makes sense. Okay, so uh, one key thing to look out for is the presence of bumps and warts on the skin of toads, and they mm -hmm. also have those two large uh, paratoid glands on their back. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, do you have any tips for spotting herbs? Yeah, if I'm honest, it's mostly just luck. So you have to, you have to, uh, I think you have to, uh, accrue a lot of luck um, but at the same time it also helps to understand the ecology of the animals that you are looking for right so if you are looking for a shore pit viper you wouldn't go to say Bukit Timah Nature Reserve because they are mangrove species so you would want to go to a mangrove to find those animals right so understanding the ecology uh, luck helps a lot but understanding the ecology I think helps you to um, get a better idea of where these animals can generally be found as well. Yeah. Okay, so even for an experienced herper like yourself, there isn't like a, one strategy, but understanding how they behave and where they live is a good start, which means all of our audience members having learned a lot today, you're, on, on, you're already in a good place. And that said, if, if any of you are keen to see our herbs in our nature parks and reserves, do note to only visit during the designated opening hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and stay on the designated trails. Mm -hmm. So for more information about these um, guidelines, do visit the N Parks website. Now to round us off, Sanka, could you share with us what is one takeaway from your conservation journey? I think for me, um, it's going to be a bit abstract, but like conservation isn't just about liking animals and you know, saying that you like animals. It's also about the people. Um, conservation is really about understanding the needs of people as well. Because if people are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis, they cannot truly care about ecosystems and biodiversity because it, it's simply not a priority. So I think one very important part of conservation is also to improve social structures, to make sure people can take care of themselves and to make sure people can can afford to care about conservation. The fact that we are here talking on Zoom about conservation is in itself a privilege and we should be able to recognize that and work towards making conservation as mainstream as possible. I think that's something that um, I've learned a lot about in the last few years. Okay, thank you, Sanka. I think uh, you summed it up very nicely. You know, community en engagement is something that's very important to us as well. And it is one of the thrusts of NPARC's Nature Conservation Master Plan. Our systematic approach to conserving biodiversity and transforming Singapore into a city in nature. 
So for more information, do check out the links being shared in the Zoom chat. Or